good morrow and good day and welcome to another campaign diary and Q&A here on Slice and Dice talking all about the Many Lands campaign and today we're going to be talking all about everything that happened in sessions 28 and 29. So that's the last two sessions as we missed uh, a uh, campaign diary last time. So uh, going to be catching up a bit. Unfortunately, the last couple of sessions have all been centred around the same point, which has been Rackfell Manor. And the party have been here for quite some time. Um, this is one that actually has been going on longer than I anticipated. Um, and it's provided some really good learning as a DM and as a creator. And so I thought I would share some of those thoughts with you guys. Uh, also, before we get into that, really big news that I should be talking about really exciting announcements of what's coming up in the next couple of weeks. So first of all, um, because I got it in the post and so it needs to be done, we're going to have a new giveaway on the channel on Monday, uh, courtesy of our friends at Creature Cave. And I've received their prizes right now, so I'm going to give you a little sneak preview to show you some of the stuff you could be winning. So uh, we've got green enamel dragon pin badge. Very nice. We also have a red dragon enamel pin badge and in addition to that we also have some lovely stickers and art all dragon related so you've got some berry dragons stickers we've got some berry dragon art or by the wonderful artist uh, verity philippal thank you verity uh, so verity at Cre uh, creature cave has provided all of these so this whole dragon bundle will be yours but you've got to get in touch with us during the stream on Monday. Uh, and, of course, through social media as well. We will be running the competition on socials as well. So you won't completely miss out uh, through the stream. But uh, keep your eyes peeled for that. Because the first part of the giveaway will be announced on Monday here on the channel. Um, also, uh, in terms of exciting stuff, two weeks' time. So next Monday, business as usual, session 30. So the big three zero. It's uh, got to be an important one. Um, uh, another milestone for the campaign uh, but the week after that the Monday after that we're going to have a very exciting one shot stream a one off uh, unlike the last one off which we had uh, with uh, James DMing and we were playing some D&D &D with superheroes it was a lot of fun that's all on our YouTube channel by the way if you haven't subscribed I suggest you should um, uh, where you can f watch that in full on our YouTube channel uh, but instead, we're not going to be playing D&D at all in two weeks' time. In fact, for this one-off, we're going to be playing an as-yet unreleased uh, board game by the name of Theurgy. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, look it up. That's T-H-E-U-R-G-Y. Uh, and that's <clears throat> excuse me and that is a new game um that's going to be released uh beginning of march so around the time that we're going to be streaming um so we'll be playing a pr game pre-release a whole new board game it's kind of similar to i think um pandemic and uh, uh and Catan. certainly um i played Catan, so i know i, I definitely recognize bits of that in there uh and i think it i think it was either pandemic or contagion it was one of the two um, that I think Marshall would said it was similar to as well. But um, anyway, really exciting. It's uh, basically like uh, where you play the part of a god and... Ah, should be studying here. Hello. Thanks for tuning in. Um, so, um, yeah, so Theurgy, you basically take on the role of one of the gods and you kind of channel yourself through your followers, uh, including sort of your uh, disciples and whatnot. Uh, and basically preach the word and try and convert uh, the world to following your religion. That's the entire kind of basis of the game. So we're going to be playing that live on the channel. That's in two weeks' time on Monday, the 2nd of March. Put it in your diaries uh, to see an exclusive pre-release of Theurgy uh, with the creators themselves are going to be here. I'll be playing and some of the regular players you'll be uh, familiar with will also be playing for that. So put that one in your diary going to be really really good fun uh, and something completely different on the stream so I'm really looking forward to that um, I'm also uh, I, I mentioned a while ago about subscribers and we've um, and uh, to be honest uh, think I've got a little sidetracked I have written a list down of potential ideas for things to offer to people for subscribing however I'm at this point really looking for feedback from you guys um, it, what would you want to get um, from being a subscriber to uh, Slice and Dice, because you can subscribe here on Twitch. So any ideas that you have, any thoughts that you have uh, on things that you'd like um, to receive as a subscriber in exchange for, you know, your hard-earned cash, essentially, um, 
please do get in touch and let us know. That'd be really good. But I will be hopefully uh, releasing uh, our sort of um, the deal, uh, essentially the subscriber deal uh, within the next month, I would hope. And lastly, um, speaking of getting um, stuff on the channel and uh, and exciting things that are coming up, we've been working in the background for a while trying to get some character art done. And hopefully um, we've now sort of secured an artist to do character art for all six of the main characters. Um, so we should have some headshots that will be going up. Uh, and in addition to that, I'm also revising our intro video, which you may remember at the moment is the kind of uh, eight bit uh, sword striking into the dice, which then separates to make slice and dice. So hopefully we're um, gonna be having a all new uh, intro video coming. Yes, oh fancy, it is <laughs> fancy indeed. Should be coming very soon. Um, again, that's gonna be in line with the art. So once the character art's back, I will then be featuring some of that character art inside the intro video so all fancy and exciting things so please uh, yeah keep an eye out for those things and thank you once again for your continued support on the channel really means a lot to me i know it means a lot to the players so just thank you guys it means a lot uh so anyway back to business then so to discuss what happened in the last couple of sessions uh so uh so the players have been at rackville manor for quite a while the entirety of rackville manor in fact the entirety of all of the um, quests in um, Slice and Dice in the Many Lands campaign have all been written by myself, with the exception of the Madness of the Rat King. That was the one uh, that actually uh, was pre-existing. Everything else I've come up with myself, the setting, uh, that's been come up with by me as well. Um, and so this um, particular quest line, the Ratfell Manor storyline, um, when I wrote it, I thought that perhaps the party would get through it in maybe sort of two or three sessions. But it's now been closer to 10 um, to get through all of it. And that's partly, I think, because of some of the extra um, the ex extra um, stuff that's been going on in the world, uh, in, in the game world. I think there's been extra items of intrigue that have been thrown in there for certain party members and so on. And so therefore things get sidetracked. Also, a thing to remember with Rackfell Manor, because um, it is a more of a social kind of encounter. It is essentially like a murder mystery, a whodunit. So there is going to be socialising and actually social encounters take a lot longer in some in some cases than they would in game time with uh, going through combat and just mowing your way through enemies and so on. Um, so it's been important to kind of, I've kind of learned from that that actually you need to allow a lot of time for social stuff. People can't just breeze through social encounters unless of course they uh, you deem it that they roll really high on their charisma check or their persuasion check or whatever and they basically get every all the information that they need straight away um i think you kind of lose some of the magic of the game if you don't engage in the role play um, especially as a viewer it's fun to see the role play occurring um and so any excuse for that is always good um <clears throat> but certainly i've learned realist i think uh, I've got a better gauge on how long things will take the party to get through, roughly, because the it always um, varies depending on numbers. The more players you have, the less gets done in the time generally, because the players usually end up talking amongst themselves. More people then have more ideas and there's more debate about what the next course of action should be. And so there's more delay generally with larger parties. Uh, with smaller parties like three, three to four players, a lot more focused and generally steam through a lot more uh, encounters and a lot more story. So another important thing to bear in mind. But basically, um, the we're now sort of wrapping up this quest line. And it's the first kind of big quest line that I've had running through the game. And it's um, it's been really rewarding, actually. Um, the reason why I've chosen to write stuff myself rather than using uh, pre-existing stories, for one, it's because, you know, I want to kind of stretch my uh, created limbs. Uh, but also um, I feel that it ha I have more control, therefore, about what's happening in the world, uh, also about how it ties into the game world. Um, and it's just kind of a creative control. I, I feel like I have a lot more creative license when I've written literally everything than if I'm sort of tied into and hamstringed into a pre-existing uh, campaign. There are lots of great um, campaign ideas and um, pre-existing, pre-generated stories um, uh, through uh, such things as um, tales of the yawn through the yawning portal, um, there's some some great ones in there. And I've I've run the uh, from the starter set the Lost Minds of Fendelver myself, and I still am with another group. 
um, and it's and it is good fun and it is really useful um, because for one thing you don't have to write everything but I've always felt with those pre-existing campaigns that I'm a lot more tied to the source material so I feel like I need to be checking things a lot more written in the text to make sure I'm not getting things wrong or to make sure that uh, I I'm saying the right bits at the right time not giving too much away etc whereas with stuff that I've written, I intuitively already know what um, things can be said, what can be given away, uh, what stuff not to say, and basically how it links up with the campaign at large. So um, yeah, I guess those are kind of my main reasons for doing that. Um, but in session 28 and 29, it was really kind of the final encounters and dealing with the, uh, the well, <laughs> session 28 was really dealing with the boss battle, if you like, although, in this um, quite interesting and it has been quite an intriguing adventure uh, through Rackfell Manor. Really the boss fight um, was never going to be as big an event as actually the, um, the the fight before it which was of course the werewolves in the banqueting hall. I think that was really kind of the most climactic um, in, uh, combat encounter in the entirety of this quest naturally because you've got people turning to werewolves on the spot. The party had to contend with six or so werewolves in the banqueting hall. Actually, I think it was eight werewolves in the banqueting hall. As opposed to in this final encounter, there was four players versus a boss. It did get intense. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, should be studying. Um, uh, as opposed to dealing with just the one assassin uh, and then his uh, guard dog, a two-headed devil dog. Um, by comparison, that was a lot less intense. That was a lot... Um, it was not as as close and it was you know it felt like that things were more in the party's favor part of that is um because the assassin from the monster manual um just like well it's a typical rogue in a sense that they're a glass can and they can do a lot a lot of damage but um especially with that assassinate ability um but it only really works in their first turn they want to hit and they want to get out and naturally with um this boss encounter um the once they had that first hit which did level Seth it knocked him out in one go it I realized at the time couldn't have killed him uh, unless the damage totaled double his hit points then that might have killed him outright otherwise um, uh, him then being brought unconscious by the hit then the con save for the poison effect from the dagger the poison effect is a, is a separate source of damage and so going by the rules um, separate source of damage means that it doesn't count as Sort of the same damage and therefore it, it can't be added together to then kill him outright it has to be uh, th that poison damage then fails a death save because the he's already been brought unconscious just by the sneak attack damage and um, that's that's how that works that's rules is written not going to argue with that but at the time it was looking a little bit ropey because that could have been nasty um and i think also um i think also with that um with that assassin given that they were then stuck in a in a crypt essentially um, not a lot of room to maneuver for them uh, and uh, things went south pretty quickly after that first uh, attack especially without any allies an assassin works really well as a rogue does in a party that it uh, rather than on their own even though they might sort of lend themselves to more loner type characters um, to have kind of uh, your tanking character or your kind of standard if you think about it in military strategy you kind of got your frontline military there to kind of hold the line soak up the hits so your barbarians your fighters that sort of thing your rogue and your monk actually i suppose as well uh, and i guess the ranger um, also occupy that kind of second line the the rogue and the monk in particular they, they're hit and run tactics they want to run in there make a hit and then get out there while the uh, barbarian or the fighter hold the hold the line and hold the enemy in place uh, meaning that then everyone else can then attack from range that's kind of um that's the sort of the bare nuts and bolts the, the basics i think of a combat encounter to make it quite challenging and in this you kind of had the devil dog to hold the line the devil dog was dispatched pretty quickly actually uh, by the party uh, and then the assassin really didn't have anywhere to go and um, once they're on their own they're not quite as they're not going to be as effective sure they can still get sneak attack occasionally but they have to get advantage first because they're not swashbucklers damn swashbucklers um so they can't just get a, a sneak attack just for attacking an enemy when they've got no other uh, enemies around them so um so anyway yes um 
whilst that on the face of it was very simple, I think complications was kind of the name of the game in, in the last two sessions. Um, for one thing, um, the party, especially Seth, decided they wanted to keep the guards that had been paid off by Fang, uh, whoever Fang is, to um, uh, to close the doors, to open the curtains. They'd been hired to pose as the actual guards at, of Rackfell Manor because the party learned through a letter that uh, the actual guard had been replaced and been sent off for retraining in Rundar. And so these uh, mercenaries who'd been hired instead to pose as the guards had instructions that when the banquet was to start to uh, open the curtains, let the, let the moon in. I, they may or may not have known about the moon bit and the werewolf bit, but they had been got, given clear instructions to open the curtains and to barricade the doors and not let, uh, not let anyone out. Um, so that in itself was, uh, I think, then caused some complications when um, Seth wanted the guards to stay and help kind of secure the place uh, in exchange for basically um, him not hunting them down. It's a valid, valid and worthy threat. But the complication with that is that we then had guards who have uh, noted, uh, because the party was speaking quite openly, one of them especially um, recognised um, Seth's likeness from one of the wanted posters, which you may remember, there are wanted posters up for uh, for Seth. Doesn't doesn't name him, but um, there are ones with his likeness, along with the other two prisoners who were on the prison wagon way back at the very beginning of the campaign. Uh, and so, people have got a good look at him now. They recognise that he's there, and this could cause some problems further down the line. We may well see some more people hunting for Seth in the future. <clears throat> Sorry, more people hunting for Seth in the future. Uh, other complications uh, would be the assassin once they captured them. They wanted to get more information from the assassin. And in, uh, and in the last session, um, when they finally came to, because the party um, searching the body hadn't, managed, hadn't really found all of these secret compartments hidden about the assassin's person, uh, the assassin managed to pull out a poison vial, which they had, uh, in a necklace, so they would have used their mouth to do it because their hands were bound, um, to pull out this necklace uh, with this poison vial and just basically commit suicide to avoid any information being given away. Now, fortunately, the party have access to um, the Speak With Dead spell, which they know because they were given that uh, the use of that by uh, Dean, by the, uh, by the uh, priest, uh, what was it? So not Dean Fringe, Dean Fringe was the werewolf. By uh, by the priest back in Hilburg, uh, and so uh, Ventrix it was Ventrix the second um, had given them access to that. So that's why Seth cut off the head of um, of the assassin because he figures they can then use the head uh, with this speak with dead spell to get some information out of them. Of course, the key uh, key area here is that um, dead. They say that a dead man never lies, but with the speak with dead spell. They most certainly can lie. It's totally within the possibility for them to lie, to be uncooperative, um, especially with the people who then killed them or were sort of the cause, in a sense, of their death. May well not be cooperative with them. Um, but I think the biggest complication that came up, and it was really kind of fortuitous because the player wasn't here, um, I had something pre prepared in case Dan was there to kind of play Fleeting Wolf. Um, but because he was the only character who'd been bitten by a werewolf and hadn't been cured, and it was the night of a full moon, of course, uh, they, the par I think the party forgot uh, about it briefly, or just assumed he would be okay uh, and wanted to keep him out of the way of the rest of the party, and so it asked him to gather up the survivors and secure them in one of the rooms upstairs, and then to kind of secure the rest of the manor, closing doors, closing curtains and the like. And he did just that. But in the moment, spotted the opportunity during um, during the last uh, during session twenty eight. Heard them saying about closing the curtains. And went, right, I will do that. Mental note, mental note. Because of course, then him going to close the curtains means he's then exposed to the moonlight himself. And uh, as it transpired, he failed his uh, check then and succ uh, succ succumbed to the uh, to the lycanthropy curse, and so transformed into a werewolf. And given his previous experience fleeting look had gone to the maze earlier on 
in, in an earlier session uh, at, while exploring Rathfell Manor and then had uh, not man quite managed to get to the centre, uh, which the party then found out about later on about why that's the case. Um, uh, but then it felt right that then this time he would go to the, back to the maze because he's told the party not to go there and probably the last remnants of his natural tiefling self would have recognised that the party won't want to go there so it's a good place to remove himself from the rest of the group and in fact you're not likely to find many people inside the maze if any um, so this would be a good place to go and in werewolf form he does get to the centre which in some ways meant that the maze then became the werewolf's lair which was in which is also interesting um, and it was nice because it was the one area left of the of the map of Rathfell Manor which I don't think had been explored uh, aside from by Fleeting himself so it was really nice then to kind of go back over that ground for the party the rest of the party then come across the same things that Fleeting had come across before um, and not to have uh, the same success as he did um, the fine so the the mains uh, had some really cool traps uh, I say that sounds egotistical even though because I did come up with them but I was really pleased with how they came out um, having the desert sleeper flower which is a uh, it's a plant of my own creation uh, and one of the things I think that made that for an interesting encounter was that um, it kind of not broke the rules but it it kind of it worked well with the rules uh, of combat in D and D, the mechanics of it, because this flower would fire off a needle every time. Uh, after each person's turn, it would fire a needle until there were no needles left. There were only ten needles, but the party weren't to know that. But it meant every turn it would fire off a needle, um, and so its own turn, it, the only thing it could do on its own turn would then be to set off the effect of these needles. Uh, and it effectively works as a tranquilizer, drugging the team and, and knocking them unconscious, um, those who have been hit by a needle. Uh, and that caused some complications in itself. Two out of the four party members fell down, fell asleep. Should be studying has asked, may I ask, how did you meet your D&D team? Oh, well, thank you very much for the question. Um, so, uh, so I met the guys. Um, interestingly, I met, met a few of them in different places. Um, so... Uh, so James, DK and Marshall, I met all three of those um, at a D&D meetup group. Uh, they play D&D on Sundays uh, and I was new to the area. Uh, I was also new to D&D actually as it went um, and saw, the, saw this, went along and had a really good time and kept on going to it. And I met all three of them through there. I think I met all three of them within the first couple of weeks. Um, and yeah, kind of kept them in mind for uh, for this uh, later on. And I think we've I think we're safe to say we've all become firm friends since then. Uh, then for the other three, now uh, Dan, who plays Fleeting Look, I didn't actually know him. I only knew him through James, and James sort of suggested um, this guy's really keen. He's he's really good on his backstories. I've DM'd for him before. He's been really good, and I thought okay. So um, I met up with James and Dan. Did a kind of test a session with them just to kind of see what he's like as a player and yeah he seemed like seemed like a good laugh seemed like he would work well with the team so uh so i invited him on board and it was kind of a similar situation with bart i hadn't met him before i had i had no clue of him but he was recommended by marta and i met marta uh through um uh, because we're both voice actors so i met her um i think i think we moved in the same circles so i, I kind of e-met her uh, online and then uh, we uh, and then I arranged to meet up with her and Bart and then the rest of the players who could come to then kind of do a trial D and D session. Master had never played D and D before uh, the stream, so but she, it was something that I knew that she'd wanted to do. Uh, and then we uh, we met up. We had a little practice game in in, in a restaurant, um, which they seemed to really enjoy. Had really good fun. It was another one that I kind of had had written myself. Um, just a test pilot it and yeah it just it just kind of worked just kind of gelled together and uh yeah since then here we are would you believe that uh bart comes all the way from uh i want to say coventry um so he he can't he takes about four hours to get here uh and when you consider that the stream only lasts about three hours that's quite a commitment uh so fair play to him for that um not saying that that's that's poo-pooing 
how, how long it takes everyone else to get here but it's just that's a freaking long way like everyone else um I'm, I'm not entirely sure but i imagine it's under an hour to get here so uh that's dedication and uh take that on board but yeah that is how i met each of the group there you go continuing on then so um as i said with complications it was really uh yeah that is dedication exactly um so with the rest of uh the sessions and the complications that came with it um actually as a dm i think the main kind of complication that uh that arose was uh, can be with different spells because uh, naturally I can't know every single spell in the player's handbook or in all the other subsequent material that's been released since then. I mean, some people have tried and some people think they know all the spells, but the thing is, is that um, there are so many that you're, you may remember the name of every single one, but I can promise you, you will not be able to remember the effects of every single spell in the game just not going to happen it's just a ridiculous amount of information and particularly since you need to have a lot of your brain occupied on dming it's and running the game itself and telling the story in front of you it's unlikely that you're going to have that much headroom or certainly in my case don't have enough headroom to then remember the niche uh, kind of effects of spells um so there needs to be kind of an element of trust with the players but also then you know it's it's knowing when to look things up and where, when to take people's word for things. Uh, so for instance, um, but also trusting that the players will know what to do with those spells and knowing how to best use them. So the best example I think uh, that came up actually on Monday was with Marshall, uh, with uh, Leoberin, because um, he and Malar both failed their charisma checks at the uh, charisma save, sorry, when facing the final challenge of the maze, which was this Medusa statue that basically would cause the fear, a fear effect over the two of them. And if they fail, uh, they would then be compelled to leave the maze by the quickest route, and that would be through the portal. Um, so uh, they both failed, but Seth was quick thinking, and uh, since the rope was already tied around Malar, he was kind of the anchor point in case things went wrong. They had made some precautions, got some rope ready. He then tied the rest of the rope around the root, uh, the stump of the uh, topiary um, Medusa, and also heaved it himself and with Brucon to try and pull uh, Malar back and to make sure that he didn't escape. But unfortunately, they couldn't keep a hold of Leobrin, who then ended up fleeing the maze. Uh, now, I'd written into the story that the uh, into into this adventure that when you're compelled to leave the maze, you cannot come back to it for an hour. Uh, you can't willingly move into it for an hour, which uh, is different, which was I thought was then in the moment thought, oh, no, this means he's basically out of the entirety of the rest of the stream. He's going to be out of the rest of the, the session sitting on the sidelines. That sucks. So on the one hand, I was then kind of thinking, ah, oh, I need to find a way to bring him back in now because this isn't right. And, you know, I think for a moment I ended up worrying and panicking a little bit about it. And then this kind of sobering thought came over me, uh, kind of a moment of clarity washed over. And in that moment, I realised, no, Marshall's a competent player. He knows what he's doing. He, he's, you know, he's one of those players that I can offer a challenge like this too and they'll take it and they'll know they'll find some way to work around the situation i just got to trust that he can do this and i realized when i when i thought that I, I, almost immediately after thinking you know what I, i'll leave him with it i think he's got this um as well as thinking i've got to be fair to the rules i can't just bend the rules or break my own rules to then let him back in because that just undermines everything that i'm trying to build here the, anyway, immediately after that, the thought that came that came was, hang on a minute, there is a way he can, he can get involved in this. He's got this Flock of Familiars spell. Now, this spell I haven't come across myself, and that's because it's from the Lost Laboratory of Kalisk or Kask or something like that. Anyway, quite a niche uh, adventure book, actually. But it happens to have a, uh, three spells in it, uh, additional spells, which are um, official material because the because uh, that book was released by by wizards of the coast um so so it's official you can use it um and yeah it was suddenly oh god yeah he can use that that flock of familiars basically means you can summon three familiars at once uh and you have to maintain concentration to keep those three 
uh, familiars for up to an hour and it takes a minute to cast to get those there. Now he already had them active at the time. Um, so it's like, okay, perfect. He can still control the familiars whilst being outside of the maze. And then he went one better because he also had the staff of the Rat King, which was originally belonging, uh, I think, to Neris. But since Neris uh, has disappeared and been replaced by a doppelganger, this has left the staff up for grabs. So uh, Leobrin uh, took that himself, which meant that he could then summon a swarm of rats and send them into the maze. Meaning, essentially, essentially he was just like an airstrike on the on the edge of the map which was great because it you know there was no there was no risk or no immediate risk uh to his character but uh which is great because he has minus one constitution and only 11 hit points at level four but yeah, aside from that um aside from that it was uh it was just an example of do you know what i need to trust my players i need to let them do this and yes, it's challenging, and yeah, they may get annoyed by this, but they're getting annoyed for the right reasons. They're getting annoyed because it's challenging, because it's difficult. They're not getting annoyed because they feel like I'm screwing them over or I'm doing them out of a game. That's not what happened at all. It they were follow, you know, I was following the rules as written for the game, and uh, and this is what we ended up with. Um, uh, yeah, uh, as I said, it's impossible to learn all the spells yourself as a DM. You've got uh, enough stuff going on uh so there needs to be that element of trust between the players and yourself and you know there also needs to be that openness that i that when you're not sure something's quite right if you think somebody's maybe interpreted something wrong you can just speak up and say uh hang on a minute can they can i just do you mind if i just check that you, or even not even saying but just looking up and going and then when you see that something's not quite right you then just quietly say you know i think this is actually what what should happen um because you've got to remember as well um that we're not only playing a game of D&D, we're also, you know, we're also performing a live stream. And so um, whilst in home games you could uh, sit back and sort of spend however long, I don't know, 15 minutes if you were really that dedicated, just looking up a certain rule because you weren't sure that this was correct and you wanted to make sure you were being entirely correct going forward uh, and entirely thorough in, your, uh, in, in the rules... Um, on a live stream that's not entertaining to watch like spending 15 minutes just arguing or debating a rule um it's not going to make for challenging uh, and entertaining viewing so we obviously have to keep that in mind as well and think sometimes uh for me i kind of want to resolve any conflict or any co uh, any sort of continuity or other sort of issues like that as quickly as possible just in the moment so and that's when i can kind of step in and go you know what in this instance this is what happens uh, and then I can always revise that later uh, and I can look it up after the stream in my free time and then I can go back to that player or to those players and then say afterwards, okay, I ruled I ruled this for the stream, but next time maybe uh, let's follow the rules. This is the rule here. Let's do it that way next time. And just have that um, open communication. Uh, should be studying says, better than Netflix. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm glad you think so. Uh, I, I, yeah. I, I'm right with you on that. Uh, with uh, I think you've got to be you've got to understand what's going on. Like with with, with um, watching D and D stuff, you've got to know some of the rules. You don't need to know everything, but it's it's good to have a basic grasp of how the game works going into it. Um, it makes it all the more enjoyable to watch afterwards. I think. Uh, so yeah, so so uh, trust and complications. And do you know I I think for today, um, let me just find the last bit to kind of keep you up to date uh, with what's happened in the session before I have one final announcement, which ties very neatly to what I've just been talking about. Uh, but I'll get to that. So um, the so they, uh, they managed to subdue uh, Fleeting Wolf and have uh, secured him and taken him back to the manor along with, uh, to, to kind of uh, keep him incarcerated along with the other two wolf prisoners that they have. But they're now going to have a dilemma for next time because they, um, the party now, what are they going to do with these three people with uh, lycanthropy? One of them being the party member. Ha uh, yes, there was a uh, potion of pure, uh, a potion of cure curse, which they used on the Oberyn, but they were told at the time that that, potion was very rare and they'd had it for years and years at Hilberg so there's no guarantee they'll be able to find more of those uh, potions um, so 
is there another way that they can cure these lycanthropes? And if not, I mean, are they just going to be carting around forever, these other two um, werewolves with the party, uh, along with the third one that's a member of the party? That feels not only dangerous because they could break out at any time and infect the rest of the party, but also um, feels like it's just unnecessary baggage. They've already got enough baggage to deal with, with a doppelganger in a chest and a stone statue of the Lady Helene Grenthorpe. They've got quite a few things that they need to take care of and that they've kind of shoved to one side while they're um, getting on with the manor. Um, so there's going to have to be some tough decisions made um, to see what they do next. One uh, source they cannot rely on unfortunately to help them with this is uh, Gant Brom, um, probably their least favourite ally uh, along with his bodyguard Howlin Cragmere who most certainly has been a good ally to the party. Howlin uh, was our first ever guest star here on the stream played by Midge and uh, Midge if you're watching thank you so much uh, he was absolutely great, uh, really brought uh, like brought Sean Bean into the room almost with uh, Howlin uh, and was a yeah, great character but also um, a really good ally for the party and one that I hope that they'll come across again in the future. Um, so we had to finally bid farewell to Gant and to uh, Howlin and his daughter Lainey uh, in the last session as they um, head, started heading back to Bronn. They kind of got all the information that they needed and it looked like the threat had been taken care of for the most part, so it was time for them to leave. But that also means that the party now are without a carriage to get home. Fortunately, they do have other nobles there that they managed to save from the ball, no doubt who arrived by horse and carriage as well. So hopefully they'll be able to blag uh, some lifts back home, or perhaps get rewarded in some other way for their services and for, um, for vanquishing and helping these nobles in their time of need. We shall see next time but um gant Bron brought another um not complication but just another reminder of things that had happened in the past as the party had traveled to ratfell manor it had taken them three days and so they'd had to stop uh, twice to rest once at the miners arms in oraglor and once uh, at the uh, uh names in heroes landing at the weary traveler there we go um, so they're going to have to retrace their steps to some extent if they want to get back to Hilberg. Um, but Gant had slipped a note to, um, to Malar and asked him to give it to the landlord at the Miner's Arms should they see him. He hasn't opened the note yet, so we shall find out what's in that note. But it's also a reminder that, yep, uh, the, the landlord from the Miner's Arms, you remember that guy that you tried to incarcerate in Heroes Landing and that I then got set freed? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I set him free. Deal with it. Yeah, he's back at he's back at the miners' arms. Here's my here's my card. He's really stamping his really asserting his authority. Gant's there. One sort of last very dickish kind of interjection. Um, very characterful. Um, I kind of like the dynamic with that um, because there's there's the obvious allies of the party. Those who are very nice to them, very amiable, want are do gooders who just want to you know help them out in their time of need. And then there are the much more fun allies to play which are the ones that mm, maybe they're self-serving kind of bastards but they're basically you know they, they put themselves first but the party are certainly certainly useful to them and so they're just on the right side that the party aren't just going to outright just stab them straight away and not outright going to just go right he's an enemy i'm going to kill him they're just on that line that you're not quite sure whether that's okay or whether like whether they're on your side or whether they're not. There's that morally grey kind of area. And Gant basically embodies that. And so he's been a lot of fun to play. So I will miss having him around for a bit. Not least because he's a bard from the College of Whispers. And that's uh, very interesting. If you've never played College of Whispers, just, just have a read of it. See what you think. It's good fun. Um... So yeah, they've kind of, um, they've left the, they're now staying at the manor. They've got a few nobles left alive that they um, will surely repay them for helping them. They've got two, now three werewolves that they need to do something about. Um, and they've also now let, they're going to be leaving uh, Rackfell Manor without a leader as Lord Niccolo Belvedere, who uh, was at Lord of the Manor, has now uh, died after being turned into a werewolf. Um, and now it falls to his uncle, uh, Rory Wimbleford, who's quite an introvert anyway, uh, or at least quite an indoors person and doesn't really, not, not really active at all to kind of uh, oversee things in the manner going forward. 
So what will happen with that? Well, we'll find out uh, uh, where we're going to be leaving things with Rackfell Manor next time. That's going to be on Monday. That's at 6 p.m. here on the channel. But before I go, uh, as I said, there's one final announcement I've got to do earlier. So there's going to be uh, I'm going to be starting a new uh, series, uh, just a kind of occasional series. This will be um, videos only going up on YouTube. It won't be live streamed because of the nature of it. You'll, you'll understand when I put it up. Um, basically, working title at the moment is called Don't Believe the Hype. Uh, and what I'm going to be covering in Don't Believe the Hype is um, so I'm a big fan of D&D, &D, as I'm sure you guys are as well. And uh, so when I'm, I get particularly excited about creating new characters. And uh, and so when I'm looking to create one, or I'm, or I'm even even when I'm looking to level up a character, I will read up a bit about different classes, about different races, about different feats, and so on. Just looking up different thing uh, aspects of um, of this uh, great game, and. Um, basically seeing suggestions on how things can be used, on recommendations on whether things are good or bad and so on, and just generally trying to get a, a better gauge uh, on certain abilities and so on. And in my reading, I have found that through going through forums, uh, Reddit, subreddits, all the rest of it, that um, generally forums can be a bit misleading because they, uh, for the most part, reviews of particularly classes tend to be uh, a bit one-sided and they s tend to be uh, geared towards uh, more mechanical kind of power gaming territory in the sense of um, the forums kind of would deem the most uh, would, would deem the best classes to be the ones that can cause the most damage output in one hit uh, and they would so for instance, they would say things like paladins and rogues are brilliant and rangers are terrible and so I wanted to kind of uh, to start this kind of counterpoint series uh, called Don't Believe the Hype to basically each time cover a um, to cover one of these uh, classes, subclasses, races or whatever that is uh, seems to it be um, put down in the media. There seems to be a lot of bad press about uh, particular classes and stuff and kind of challenge those views and say, well, why is that? Um, for instance, I'm a massive fan of the Ranger. Now, uh, yeah, I'm probably hearing people already who are going, why? Why? The Ranger's terrible. It's the worst class in uh, 5e Dungeons and Dragons. Well, I disagree. Um, that's kind of the, the basis of, um, of Don't Believe the Hype is. I don't think that's true. I don't think they are terrible, and here is why. Um, uh, and equally, uh, actually, I think, because for me, when I'm creating a character, I'm not trying to make one that's going to be the most powerful, that's going to cause the most damage in one hit, that's, uh, you know, I'm not looking to uh, to create a, um, a min-max kind of, you know, uh, a number crunching character, because I feel that you're losing a lot. If you game the system, yes, it's a game, but it's a role-playing game. And so if you just concentrate on the game side of things and you start losing the role playing aspect of the game, you're missing out on a vital component and probably, well, at least for me, one of the most enjoyable parts of the game. Uh, I think what kind of lines up with that is the notion of leaning into your dump stat. I don't know if you've heard the expression, lean into your dump stat, because when you build a character uh, with the standard array, uh, you get these numbers to put into your abilities 8 10 uh, 12 13 14 and 15. 8 is obviously uh, putting 8 into a stat means you get negative 1 to that stat meaning that all ability checks involving that will have a minus 1. That would be called a dump stat if you leave it be and you put your um, and you're putting points into other abilities that one ability being uh, in the negative is a dump stat. And I think it's important to lean into that because I feel that, you know, a character's, sh the most, um, uh, let's see, the most uh, the most easily to identify with characters, the characters that, that we resonate with, that we are drawn into the stories of, that we are compelled to cheer for, um, the heroes that you read about in stories, they're never perfect. They always have a fatal flaw. Superheroes always have a weakness. There needs to be something that makes them not perfect. There needs to be something that humanizes them 
And that in uh, in the mechanics of Dungeons and Dragons would be a dump stat. It would be something that they're not good at. That's their thing that they're terrible at. And I think it's really important to lean in with that. And uh, my first sort of long term character that I made for, for Dungeons and Dragons, I know, surprise, is a gnome, was a forest gnome ranger. Absolutely love this character to pieces. It's great because mechanically it is not the best build for a ranger. It's not the best build for a gnome. It's it, those two combined, just not a great combination technically. However, it's been really fun to role play. Um, it works mechanically. Um, also, I, I will get onto this when I finally do this. Um, don't believe the hype about the ranger because the ranger has the, some of the best spells in the game. But we'll talk about that later. Um, and one of the other things was that he had a minus one on his charisma. He had uh, he was not charismatic at all. But just because he's got a negative charisma, that doesn't mean that he's shy and retiring and doesn't want to get involved in social encounters. Oh no, quite the opposite. This guy wanted to get involved with every kind of social encounter. He was uh, he tried to be a flirt. The important thing is he tried, uh, and it was really fun to play him because it was like. He would get himself into social situations and would just try it, and he'd all, you know always go for it, and he'd roll, and you know most of the time that roll would not work out the way you wanted it to, but you know what? He tried so damn hard, and that was what was compelling, that was what was fun to play, and it was what was fun for the rest of the uh, the players in the group as well to witness him trying so damn hard, even though he's clearly terrible. Like that, that is a hero in itself that they they're trying something even though they're not good at it, but they're doing it for the good of the party or for whatever reason. Um, so yeah, I'm as you can tell, passionate about uh, that, about uh, leaning into your dump set, about humanizing your characters by make by giving them these weaknesses, giving them these flaws. There's a there's a reason why on the character sheet you have flaws as a box to fill in. You have ideals, you have personality traits, and then in the middle you have bonds, people you're attached to. You have flaws in there. Don't ignore that. That's there for a reason. That's just as important to your character as their as their ideal as their uh, personality type as their drive as their as the people they're connected to the flaw is very important and so um circling back don't believe the hype is uh, the new series i will be starting very soon and releasing on youtube keep your eyes on that if you're not subscribed to us or following us on youtube please do so already there is a link on our twitch page um just with the youtube icon on it, it says catch up Click on that, it'll take you straight to our YouTube channel and you can follow there just at the touch of a button, nice and easy. So yeah, for those classes that you think, you know what, I'm just hearing a lot of bad stuff about them, I will most likely be covering them. I'm talking the Ranger, including the Beastmaster Ranger, the Hunter Ranger. Uh, for, oh, Saving, Throw, Saving Throws HQ was just followed, thank you very much. Appreciate that, really means a lot. Um, that will mean uh, the uh, Four Elements Monk. Oh, that gets a lot of hate online. I'll be covering that because I'm just playing one at the moment and it is a lot of fun. Uh, that'll also be covering the Valar Bard. The Valar Bard. I read online that the Valar Bard is like the worst kind of bard. Why? It's fantastic. And I'll be talking about that all in uh, eventually covering all of those things in Don't Believe the Hype, which will be coming on YouTube uh, very, very soon. I will stop saying that phrase now and I will stop saying anything else because that is the end of today's stream. As I said, we'll be back on Monday, usual time, 6 p.m. here on the channel for session 30. Can you believe it? 30 sessions, very exciting. Uh, come join us for that. And until then, guys, stay safe and have a great weekend. Mm -hmm.